and welcome back to the Splitting Hairs podcast presented by Jack Herbert Illustrated. Uh, we have a special edition coming at you tonight, uh, and it's Matt joined by Ben from the infamous B Team podcast, B Team Mafia. What's going on? Uh, and we are joined tonight by the head honcho, the athletic director at South Dakota State University, Justin Sell. Justin, how you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, always, always good to catch up with you. Uh, I mean, you were part of my first year here uh, and experience, so I've known you uh, obviously a long time, and uh, quite a few things have transpired over the years. So it's good, good to see your face, and great to talk to you tonight. Yeah, it is. It is good to see you. Um, it has been two years somehow since we've had you on the podcast. So uh, apologize for that. You, we need to get you on more often for sure. Um, and, and two years ago, when you talked to Chad and Kyle, uh, we were in some pretty interesting territory um, with COVID and having no idea what was coming at us um, <laughs> over the next two years. So uh, how was it to, to have more of a normal year this year and to, to feel like at least um, athletically we're on the other side right now? How, how does it feel to, to now versus two years ago when we had that talk with you? Yeah, you know, uh, I think it's it's hard to separate them out. You, you know, in, in our world, you're obviously continuing to try to grow, to try to improve, add facilities, raise more money, uh, recruit the right uh, student athletes, uh, hire the right coaches, and then hopefully keep them. You know, and, and when you think about uh, the pandemic, I think going into it two years ago, certainly there was no there was no book. There was no, you know, no one had any experience in it. And I think uh, kind of the underpinnings of the success today was we just figured out how to peel back and, and one, focus on other people, uh, you know, and try to think about what are the things that are important to us, um, what makes South Dakota State special. And I, I think the ability for us to, to band together, we know who we are, we know what we're about. Um, you know, and I think that first auction that we did when we kind of had to move it virtual and ended up raising $1.736 million, uh, supported Feeding South Dakota, supported high-need high scholarships on campus, as well as raising money for athletic scholarships, helping local businesses, uh, but, you know, buying gift cards for restaurants that were obviously struggling. And when you see all those pieces that were in there, I think it really kind of turned us from how do we survive this to, you know what, we, we not only can survive it, we can figure out how to thrive. And that might look a little different. We might have to focus on some different things. We certainly needed to be much more aware um, of what was going on around us. And then how do we support our students? And at the end of the day, the people in, on my team, you know, that I'm really proud. We didn't furlough anybody. We didn't cut any positions. We were able to really focus on the people part of who we are. And I think in doing that, it helped us kind of uh, continue to, to build on the culture that we have for the last 10 or 12 or 14 years. And um, I think that's really led to now where we're in a year that maybe is a little more normal. Um, we're rolling. I mean, we took a step up during the pandemic. And I think it was all those kind of key uh, banding together and just rolling up some sleeves and supporting each other. We supported our campus. Uh, you know, our coaches jumped in and helped with all kinds of things on campus. And I, I'm just I'm really proud of that. But I think that's also what's laid the base for us to be successful. So it hasn't really felt like, oh, my gosh, we're back to normal other than having all our fans back, um, mm -hmm. having our crowds uh, part of this thing, um, you know, being able to maybe more freely travel. Um, and the other thing, and I'll, I'll continue to knock on wood, we did not have one game canceled because mm -hmm. of COVID-related reasons for our program in two years. And, and that's wow. just a huge tribute to our folks on campus. Uh, we're extremely helpful in the testing and, and uh, that, those kinds of things. And then our coaches and our student athletes made the right decisions, uh, you know, and they worked really hard to make sure uh, we could play. And uh, I think through that all, it says uh, a whole lot about SDSU. And, and uh, it's been great to be back into a more normal for sure. Yeah, definitely. definitely. So as far as like the financial side of it, did we see much of a financial hit from that? I mean, it, it helped them be in South Dakota where, you know, we didn't have those hard restrictions where you just couldn't have people around each other. But I guess, how did we come out financially? 
Yeah, you know, uh, first off, again, being part of a great university, uh, you know, the support that we have on this campus, and then our, our fans, our donors, our corporate sponsors. I, I said to a lot of people over the last year and a half, uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues and friends in this business, they were getting calls right away, uh, you know, when are you going to refund my tickets? Um, you, you're not going to put up my signs, our fans aren't going to see them, so when, how much money do I get off my corporate sponsorship? Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, as a donor, uh, you know, what are you going to do for me? And, and South South Dakota State, our, our people are so different. It was people were calling me and, and saying, I can't imagine what you're going through. What can we do to help? Wow. And so a lot of our fans kept their money in with us. You know, we found creative ways to deliver, uh, to do some different things, to be accessible. Um, you know, and I think we bridged that gap really well. Obviously, ticket revenue was our biggest hit, a uh, little bit on the NCA revenue side, but you know, through COVID and working with our university, we were able to fill kind of that loss of revenue gap uh, with some COVID dollars that balanced our budget. And so uh, we actually, we did a great job managing expenses. Obviously we had no recruiting, uh, that was all done by Zoom. Uh, we had no travel for a while. So we were able to really manage our expenses well. I give our coaches a ton of credit. Uh, they did a great job of really bringing that down where we could still make sure all our student athletes had scholarships, make sure all our employees stayed employed. And then we figured out how to play some games, uh, you know, a year ago in the spring when every team was playing. And um, so we, we actually came out really well. And then this year has been, you know, home run year in terms of uh, the support that we have, the number of tickets we sold. Uh, the corporate sponsorships are back and full, uh, you know, and our don donations are at all time high. So uh, we, we've come out of it in in, uh, in pretty darn good shape. Well, hey. it looks like looks like we're setting ourselves up for the next pandemic with the <laughs> sounds like. Well, hopefully not next pandemic, but there is a uh, I, I saw there was like we're, we're going to be one of the metaverse universities like that got announced today. Oh, I don't yeah. know if you saw that. Um, so I was wondering, like, do you know anything about that? And like, I was even wondering how that's going to affect student athletes, if they'll be able to take advantage of that, you know, while they're traveling and stuff. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I just saw it come out today, too. So, uh, you know, I don't have uh, as much information or how it might impact us. But, you know, another really cool thing for our university and and people on the outside need to understand, like when we're recruiting students here, uh, the quality of our programs, like the academic programs and our willingness to allow student athletes to be in any of those uh, to take advantage of all kinds of different things really has turned into a recruiting advantage for us. So all of those types of things end up being really good. Uh, they round the student experience. Um, you know, students want to be part of a successful university too. Um, it's not just the athletic program. And that's just another great example of kind of the cutting edge uh, mindset of, of SDSU. And President Barry Dunn is, is great in leading in that way. And, uh, you know, I think we're all proud of uh, those efforts of things that happen across our campus. And I'm kind of interested to see where that one goes. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that's really interesting. You mentioned uh, just the recruiting piece from the whole campus and everyone kind of buying in. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw it, but there's that half hour video that's out there from this national college mm -hmm. campus publication. You know, there's a couple of student athletes in there and stuff, but man, that's just such a cool selling point and, and showed all the beautiful facilities on campus, both academic and uh and, and athletic. I mean, what a cool way to showcase our university to a national audience. Um, that's a heck of a video if you haven't watched it yet, anyone listening. So uh, pretty cool. Re it re-recruited me. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Justin, you mentioned um, a little bit there uh, on, on facilities. And we've had a, an exciting year with facility upgrades at least the last six months. Uh, talk a little bit about that. What's the timeline for uh, the new arena or the the remodeled First Bank and Trust? Is that what it is? What are we What are we calling it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I would say renovated. renovated. Uh, yeah, renovated uh, First Bank and Trust Arena, and uh, you know, most of it will be interior, obviously, to the the current structure. We when we built the practice gyms a couple of years ago, we left space between the south uh, end of Frost, the big wall and the practice gyms, because that's going to end up becoming, you know, your main corridor, your main entrance. And so the, the lower level will be uh, team rooms, locker rooms, uh, some coaches offices. And then 
The second level will be this fantastic concourse. Uh, so the southeast corner where all the big parking lots are uh, will be a two level glass entrance. It, it'll be dramatic. And then you're gonna walk up some stairs and you'll have a main concourse that will now connect the entire building. Uh, you know, you can walk around and have concessions, restrooms and all those pieces. And then a really uh, unique piece to it is we'll have uh, the whole wall on the left side or the south side as you walk in on that concourse is going to tell the story, the history of the barn, the history of Frost Arena. Uh, it's going to have all of our trophies and, and uh, big moments. And I think it'll be a, a real showcase, uh, something that we're really proud of. When you change the name of a facility, just like the stadium, you know, we, we recognize Coughlin alumni by doing the Coughlin alumni room and kind of paying homage to that history. Same thing with Frost and same thing with the barn. We don't want to forget where we came from. That was really important to First Bank and Trust as well. And so, you know, as you move forward, you want to respect uh, those things. And then the upper level in that main concourse is going to be suites that will overlook mm -hmm. the, uh, the floor. So um, some really cool elements uh, in that process. But that will be the new piece, the connector. Everything else will be done interior. Looks like there's a kind of a fun student aspect. There's like going to be a student lounge or something in there. Yeah. So, you know, you go through these projects, uh, number one, uh, just trying to create a great fan experience. And so having something for everyone, uh, having some tickets that are the same price as today, so everyone can have access or afford it, uh, certainly being tuned into families and uh, our faculty staff on campus. Uh, we'll certainly have premium areas so people can upgrade their experience, but uh, students make or break the environment. And uh, so we wanted to be engaged on the front side. So they've been helping us design uh, their section, certainly with the uh, pep band and, and our spirit uh, squads and trying to tie all those things together. And then uniquely, I just, you know, as we got into the design, I'm like, I don't know anywhere else in the country that's done a VIP or a club room for students. And I'm like, well, what? let's throw it in. Let's see, see if we can do something that would really maybe upgrade that experience. Um, it can be used for other events on non-game nights. Uh, you know, you could certainly have an SA meeting in there. We can, we can have our SAC meetings in there. I mean, uh, the furniture is movable, uh, so it'll be very versatile space, but gives us a chance to maybe, uh, get after students in a little different way, get them to the games, maybe increase uh, membership in the rabbit den, um, you know, and, and then uh, we've got a thousand seats for students. So, uh, you know, it's it's uh, fifth of the building is going to be students and uh, we hope uh, they, they want to show up like they have. Uh, they've been really good the last couple of uh, years outside the pandemic time, but football and basketball, we've, we've had some really good student attendance and we want to encourage that. Getting them involved, hopefully we get the uh, – uh, buy-in from them too, uh, to want to be engaged, to want to come over. And so we're working really hard on that end to connect with them. And then ultimately you want to create an experience that they want to buy tickets when they graduate, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, why not have something that's um, kind of uh, what we always put in for all the uh, the adults or the premium mm -hmm. folks. Uh, let's give our students a chance to maybe experience that a little bit. And then on the east side, so opposite of the students, we're going to do a party deck. And so we'll have some seating and then we'll, we'll kind of level it off and we can do everything from group things. We can sell certain tickets to that. We can do single game pieces, but uh, it'll be basically kind of like having a sports bar in the arena, uh, you know, which is a lot of higher end places. Uh, people want to just come and be part of that uh, environment, maybe watch some of the game, but socialize too. And so uh, we've got a little something for everyone. I think uh, I'm really excited about uh, what we've put together. So you, you mentioned the word bar. <laughs> Does that, I mean, are we, are we talking alcohol sales for well, the yeah, public? I mean, well, yeah, here's the deal. I mean, uh, um, you know, for years we have, we, we have the alcohol in our premium spaces in the stadium and, right. and we have, uh, you know, private spaces for basketball games. And so, you know, we are, we're, we are distributing alcohol. And I think, uh, you know, for the, um, you know, general fan uh, to have the opportunity to come and experience that and, and not have to pay a premium price to get in there. Not everyone can do that. Not everyone can access that. And I think we've proven through the two major concerts that we had in the uh, Dana J. Dykow Stadium, we can handle it. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, just it's an expectation in terms of across the, the industry. We're becoming one of the few that uh, in terms of states that really don't have alcohol sales. And 
and we need to be mindful. Uh, you know, you don't want to change your environment in a negative way, but everywhere we've looked at, it's reduced issues. It's made it a better uh, uh, fan experience. It should get more people to want to come out to games. I, I frankly, I think it'll make tailgating even better in the mm -hmm. football stadium. And uh, so there are just some great opportunities. I know the Board of Regents has been working with our students and discussing that topic. And, you know, I'm excited to see where that uh, where that goes. If if you haven't, folks, uh, if you're not familiar with where this issue is at, I'd really suggest you give Addison DeHaven a follow on Twitter. He writes for the Register, and he has done a terrific job uh, tracking this, um, you know, and providing updates on it throughout the last six months, nine months, maybe even longer. Uh, he does a really good job if you're not following Addison already. So, well, and then so one, oh, go ahead, Ben. I was gonna say, if if you need any support, let us know. We're we're obviously for it. We can get like a petition going. We can get all <laughs> kinds of signatures for you. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Our, the student group did a great job putting it together. I have to give them a lot of uh, compliments. Uh, you know, it's it's hard for students to have the context of you know an industry or the things that you know. A lot of times, it's what well, we just want beer, and uh, you know that message doesn't always work. And they really figured out how to tie this together and how to do it in a, in a safe way that it'll enhance uh, the things we do uh, with students. Um, hopefully, it'll get a lot more juniors and seniors to to want to come to some of those games and then we want them to stay and, and be part of that uh long after they become alums and mm -hmm. uh they just they did a really nice job very mature very thoughtful uh you know and and you know a lot of people run right to the revenue that you can drive so much more revenue but it, it's way beyond that in terms of that experience and access to you know folks that that do want to come and, and be able to enjoy that and then being able to separate that out maybe for others that aren't interested in that or don't want a crazy environment around them uh, mm -hmm. i think we can accomplish all those things i think we can do it safely and then it does give us a chance to drive revenue and in in that hopefully uh you know in theory we we need less money from the university we need less money from student fees uh, that we're, we're able to stand a little bit more even on our own uh, mm -hmm. having some of those uh, options to drive some dollars to. Mm -hmm. And Justin, we've you've touched on it before. Um, you know, the student fee piece, I think you do a really good, a really responsible job uh, with student fees compared to uh, some of the peers in the FCS that may be moving to the FBS uh, this mm -hmm. fall. Mm -hmm. uh, James Madison looking at you. Um, so, you know, as a former essay president myself, just kudos to you for, for really being mindful and respectful of that student fee piece over the years. Um, yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. It's been important to me from day one, and it really works because our, our don donors and supporters are so great. You know, we mm -hmm. when, when I when I arrived, I think we had a ten and a half million dollar budget. Um, you know, seven and a half million came from students, the university, and the state. Well, here we are, thirteen years later, and. Uh, we're 21 or $22 million budget and about the same amount comes from those sources. And so, you know, we've worked really hard to try to grow on our own and that's taken great corporate partnerships. That's taken more ticket sales, certainly NCA money, but the donors have really stepped up and I mean, that's tremendous growth. And then to do it so students can put their money into other things on campus that are important to them. Um, you know, we, we hope that they value athletics and what we bring to the table. But, you know, the, the big number we always look at, Matt, and probably looked at years ago is that that percentage of, uh, you know, what we drive in revenue versus what the university or student fees support and FCS playing uh, football playing schools, typically about 72 percent of their budget comes from the state university or student fees. And uh, we had it down to as low as 39% a couple years ago. We're about 45, 55 right now. So we're generating uh, at least 55 to 60% of our revenue, uh, which is a, just a tremendous story. It's probably in the top five in the country, not 5%, but like the top five uh, wow. with FCS football wow. playing school. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a really cool story. I don't think a lot of people out there maybe know that. Uh, you know, and, and President Dunn, uh, on the flip side, wants to make sure the university is engaged as well. Uh, you know, the closer you get to zero, the more that donors start to drive decisions, too. And that's not necessarily where we want to be. This is a we're part of this institution and should be. Uh, and that, that's a really important mix to get right. Yeah. And one other thing before we get another question, um, you know, those that have never worked in higher ed or, or been a part of it, it is a slow moving ship, typically. Um, 
the first time Justin came and talked to our student association about the basketball arena renovations was in the fall of 2009. <laughs> and, and he brought in the diagrams and the, and the big poster boards and stuff that were up on the easels. And we all thought it was going to be the coolest thing that was going to be happening next year. <laughs> um, and it's just, it's a slow moving ship and a slow process. Uh, so Justin, again, um, kudos to you on that. Scott kind of uh, echoes this right here. Good timing, Scott. Thanks. So, <laughs> so before we move on from the basketball arena, can you give us a just a short update on like the timeline as far as like are we going to miss any games in the stadium? Are they going to be reduced capacity? Anything like that? Yeah. So the number one objective was uh, to try to work around uh, the seasons. I really feel it's important for our seniors to finish their careers in our building, not not in another building or. Uh, having to find alternate places to play. And so you'll see a lot of work done here mid-May this year through through the fall, but we'll work around volleyball. There might be some areas in the building that will kind of close off, but uh, but we'll have it open. And then certainly for uh, men's and women's basketball and wrestling, it'll be uh, wide open for uh, the playing seasons. And then, you know, next year we can get in March 1st uh, at the end of the season and uh, work, you know, kind of pick up a couple extra months next year that we don't have here this year. And again, work through into the fall. And then the fall, the last year in 2024, uh, we'll do the same, come in March 1st and finish it off. So what you'll see is, you know, the first piece, the, the big staircase on the southeast entrance will be taken out here this summer because that's where we have to access construction wise to get things in. And so you'll see some things there, some some interior work with the HVAC systems and removing some old pieces uh, uh, in, in Frost now. And then the second year we come in and the whole second level will be done. So all the permanent seating will be put in and the club room will be done. Uh, and the student club will be done. And then the third year we come in and we do the lower level seating, the floor and the suites. Uh, so that's kind of how it works out. And so it should be open by September-ish of 2024 in the fall of 2024. Wow, oh, cool. Uh, and, and Ben is also a big time connoisseur of concession stands and bathrooms and making sure there's the appropriate amount. Uh, can you guarantee him his own personal <laughs> urinal so he never has to wait in line? <laughs> I can't, I can't guarantee that, but I can, I can guarantee uh, there's going to be a big uh, reduction in, uh, in lines. I think you might actually be able to uh, both use the restroom and get a hot dog at halftime uh, or an ice cream cone, or uh, it's kind of been a pick or choose one or the other, I think when we're full, but um, you know, we, we also hope to keep some lines in the building because that means we're putting 5,000 plus people in the place every night. So I don't mind a, a, a reasonable uh, line or, uh, but we need to do that better. And uh, having the full concourse is going to help tremendously. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think we'll be in good shape there. Yeah. And, cool. and by the, and by the way, just on the food side, you know, with uh, kind of uh, uh, we've got to move to a new, uh, a new group Sodexo to do food. And so just the, the chance and Aramark's been uh, extremely good to us in athletics. I, I need to say that, you know, our auction, the meal we serve there is incredibly good. Um, they, they've done as good as they can, you know, especially concessions are tough and like Frost, the, the facility is terrible to try to do that in. And uh, they've done really good work to try to get us through some of those things. But I think having new space, uh, adding some new menu options, adding some premium items, uh, trying to mix it up a little bit, uh, you know, that's really on our minds as we move into it too so i think we can uh, upgrade the experience for everybody as well so there's new food is that for the football games too or is that just basketball arena no that's across the board so we'll it look is. at uh you know how we do everything including suites in the club room uh certainly our concession stands how we manage our catering uh you know we have a good chance to look at some things uh um, and the world's changed a lot too and how we deliver uh those pieces and you know, is there something we can do bringing things to people's seats, you know, some like really upgraded experiences. We want to take a look at all of those different things and and uh, ways to go about uh, just serving people better, giving more options, uh, you know, kind of upping the quality of the things that we do. And, um, you know, we, we've uh, we've got a chance uh, to really look at it because we'll have the space to now do it and do it uh, in the right way. Great. That's that's awesome. Uh, well, Justin, could you say... 
I was say before on, we man. move on from facilities, uh, I don't know if you were moving on, but I did want to mention the soccer stadium. That's exciting mm-hmm. as well. Uh, can you give us an idea of like a timeline on that and uh, like where it's going to be and uh, all those details? Yeah, let, let me just run down a couple things real quick. Obviously, we've been really fortunate because if you think back to 2014, that's when we put up the S Jack. 2016, we put up the football stadium. Uh, by 2024, we'll have the arena. So now we have, uh, uh, you know, the three big ones uh, that impact all of our student athletes and our fans and, and frankly, uh, students on our campus just with the kind of multi-purpose use of those facilities, uh, the practice gyms uh, for the, uh, the arena as well. You know, we did that project. And so uh, we've got wrestling that we're working on here that will open next fall. Uh, so you'll see a lot of work done, uh, you know, by uh, the Dykehouse Student Athlete Center on the uh, kind of north uh, side of the stadium and, and to the west. And so that'll be all worked on here this summer. And it'll be an incredible facility. It'll allow Damien really the opportunity. I think we're going to be a top 10 wrestling program for the years to come. I really do. And we're going to have all Americans and national champions coming out of that place. Uh, mm-hmm. That facility will be a big part of it. And then, you know, our soccer stadium project, uh, really excited with the, the drawings we put together. You know, we're out trying to find a, a lead donor like we have on our other projects. And to get that program, program back on campus. I mean, Brock's done a great job, but over the years, I think they've been in six NCAA tournaments and, uh, you know, one of our more successful programs from the transitioning uh, era all the way through. And so, um, you know, we want to try to help support those student athletes. So we've got those plans. They would go just east of the stadium uh, on those grass fields. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, softball is, uh, you know, Chris has done an amazing job with softball. Uh, We're going to be good for a while here hosting the Summit League tournament uh, and championships here in uh, a couple weeks in May, Um, you know, and and she's done a great job with, we got some party decks out in the outfield. If no one's seen those yet, I I went and stood on them last weekend. They're incredible. Uh, They're, they're awesome. It's a great view of the game, but um, you know, and if we could get turf on that field uh, you know, that would really help us expand the seasons and be able to play you know, a lot, a, a, a lot more. Um, that's the hardest part of spring. And then the last one would be just turf on the baseball field as well. Uh, you know, so we're getting frost on uh, and turning into first bank and trust arena really starts to get us down to the, you know, final few projects. And then I would argue, I'm not sure there's a place that would have better athletic facilities anywhere in the country. Um, so it's kind of uh, fun. It'll be great to see those projects through. I'm gonna have to bring uh, bring my kids to that the softball the summit league softball tournament that uh, that's gonna be kind of cool I think down there so um, man you just like ran through ran through it all there if <laughs> what what a uh, what an incredible year success wise for the department you know if you go back you know to the calendar year and we were in Frisco um, you know competing for a national championship and then in the fall. Uh, again, football is highly successful. Um, volleyball made the conference tournament, not only made the conference tournament, won a game and uh, took a very good USD squad to, uh, you know, the fifth set. Um, you know, our our cross country uh, was, was incredible again. Um, and then, you know, softball has been very good this spring. Um, soccer was very good last fall, just tremendous defense. I, I think that didn't they set some sort of record for fewest goals allowed in a season or something like that? Both basketball squads, wrestling qualified uh, for for the national tournament. Um, just this type of success isn't normal. How how have you gone about building this program? Because this this wasn't always like this, and there has been some dark moments. That we mentioned the transition period earlier. How did you do this? Uh, first, it's not me. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you realize it's, and I, and I figured it out really quick in my first year, it's, uh, it, it's the talent you can put around you, you know, and, and that talent has to be at the presidential level and our leaders on campus, you know, Provost Hedge is outstanding, Vice President Willis, uh, Vice President Green, uh, uh, Vice President Holbeck. I mean, all those people are huge parts of our success. Uh, then you then you work into hiring the right people, the right coaches, uh, talented people, draw other talented people. And uh, when you get folks that can all be on the same page, uh, like I said before, we know who we are. We're really proud of who we are. 
you know, we've refined that. We've continued to just build and, and work on getting better uh, every year and, um, you know, and pulling that together. And then you had a whole group of donors and, and folks that have supported us. Many have supported us for 30 and 40 years, but a lot of new ones have jumped on board. And I think, uh, you know, their willingness to give gifts to transform uh, our place, not as a transaction, not what are you going to do for me? It was to transform our university, to transform our athletic program. And and I said before, you know, all the all the upgrades on campus, I think the SJAC was the 14th building uh, during President Shequin's time that was done. You know, it wasn't like we let out of the gate with that. There were uh, 13 other buildings that were done on campus. Well, that impacts the student athletes that we're trying to recruit. And, uh, uh, you know, when you're recruiting to a great campus and then obviously we were starting to build some momentum, we got we got lucky. We won some games at the right time, too, um, you know, and and I think all those things just aligned. And then we never really got too far ahead of ourselves. We didn't we didn't try to, like, uh, change the world in one day. You know, it was look, we got to put down a good season and then we got to put down a good year. And then we need to do that year after year after year. And once you start doing that after eight or nine or 10, you can start to say, all right, I think we've built a pretty good program. Uh, but it, it takes time to do that. And our world is so fleeting. It's, it's it, people chase everything. And uh, I just think that's, that's really been the component. We've kept a, a lot of coaches have been here a long time. Um, you know, and, and we just continue to find a way to get one or two or three percent better every year. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you're right when you I, I'm almost I can't keep track of all the championships or, uh, you know, the men's basketball record of 141 and seven over 11 years at home. The women winning 26 of their last 28. I think Brock's undefeated or without a loss in his last 28 home games. I think the next nearest school is Florida State at 16. Uh, you know, it, and that's beyond all the championships and the NCAA appearances. I mean, cross country won four of them in mm -hmm. six months last year, <laughs> um, you know. And so when you go from the last 15 months, arguably have been the best run uh, that we've ever had. But I would argue if you looked across our leagues and you can take the Summit League, the Missouri Valley, the Big Sky, the OVC, I don't care. I'm, I'm not sure uh, it would stack up there at the top of maybe any of those lists. And and then, you know, just appreciating uh, the moments you're in, appreciating the success you have, being thankful, frankly, and grateful that we work at such a great place, that we get to invest our time in that place. We have a chance to win um, every year. And, and um, I, I just think those things kind of, uh, they're starting to come natural to us uh, and we've just gotten good at it. But it is all about the people you have around you. You know, I, I'm, I have the best AD job in the country. Uh, there's no question about it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, you know, and then we hope to make all you proud at the end of the day. It's kind of simple. Like we're going to work really, really hard to do the right things all the time. And then uh, winning is part of that process. So, uh, yeah, I just uh, I'm, I'm uh, very, very thankful. Cool. Well, put. that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Ben. Uh, so. I do want to touch on uh, one of the bigger, you know, you mentioned the kind of the, one of the most successful periods for SDSU ever athletically. Um, and I think the kind of the crowning achievement there was the the WNIT championship. Um, can you touch on kind of that, that process of, you know, how awesome it was to have the, the support to get those home games and, you know, how that all went? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, first off, anytime you're really, really busy in March, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, more years than not, we're really busy in March. There's no <laughs> spring break. There's no vacations. There's no time off. It's put the pedal to the metal. So uh, first, I got to thank my staff for, uh, you know, number one, their willingness. Uh, a lot of schools don't want to bid uh, a lot of whether it's a conference tournament or these kinds of things. It's a lot of extra work. I mean, uh, we, we have busy lives and busy jobs and you're throwing in uh, you know a massive tournament and so I'm really thankful for Christy Williams and uh, Jeff Holm and and certainly Jordan Bow and Zach Hagen in our ticket office and Megan Frosseth who does our all our marketing and all those pieces the coordination the willingness to not only bid them and, and host them but try to do it at a really high level I, I don't know that they get enough credit I you know I walked into our building and just took a step back 
you know, we have a big D1 experience in our building. You know, we, we played second fiddle to nobody. And uh, I was just really proud of how, whether it's an advertisement, whether it's our diversity video that kicks off the game or the way we handle the national anthem, Kevin Kessler and the pep band deserve a ton of credit. They're the best fans we got. And uh, Kevin is just unbelievable teammate, uh, you know, and they, they raise the bar a whole nother level. So, Credit to all that. Then our fans are willing to buy tickets and not six dollar tickets like most places. They buy seventeen and twenty and twenty five dollar tickets. And so when you get into these bidding processes, um, you're kind of bidding, knowing our fans are going to show up. They're going to support us, and so uh, we can be pretty aggressive on those bids. And and uh, we certainly were. And by the time we got to the finals, uh, you know, we certainly bid enough that. Um, we, we wanted to make sure that was in Brookings. And uh, mm-hmm. so, you know, it uh, turned out really, really good for us. Uh, that tournament was worth everything playing it here. If we went to Tuscaloosa or if we went out to uh, Los Angeles or we had to go uh, to New Jersey and that thing, um, you know, our fans certainly would have watched and been involved and cared if we won or lost. But you miss that connection. You miss that build around how great our university is. The fact that everybody's trying to call and get tickets and they yeah. can't. Uh, you can't get in, you know, and you got all our senators calling and all the all the people that you know, <laughs> want to be in that building. And it's just uh, it's just really a really cool experience. But, um, yeah, our fans give us a chance to be pretty aggressive and make sure those games are here in Brookings. Cool. Um, so so now we have to address the elephant in the room, Justin. Uh, we we and uh, I guess your baseball program have caused quite a stir in the last few days. Uh, about about alternative jerseys. Uh, if can you show us what you're wearing uh, today? <laughs> what, what, what do you mean? I didn't know anything was going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> so, so, okay. So, did did Rob come to you? Did the players come to you? Uh, like who? How did you come up with this? The concept for it, or or who did? How this happen? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, this was really around baseball, and like all of our teams. First off, let me say. I'm a, I'm certainly a traditionalist by nature. I think it's really important as you build a brand, you have to stay true to what you are. I, I, I really feel that way. I think, you know, the Jackrabbit running rabbit logo has been really good uh, for us, uh, you know, especially as we transition into Division One. I, I think, uh, you know, I love being in uh, any time we're in blue. Um, I love it. I, I think, uh, you know, that's that really is us. And uh and so at the same time, you know, as, as we've evolved, uh, student athletes certainly love to have uh, maybe a little more flash sometimes <laughs> or try some different things. You know, I, well, I love our uh, um, royal blue and our yellow and our checkerboard and all those things. You know, sometimes they want to try something different. And, uh, you know, I think that's uh, great to take a look at, especially when you can tr- tie it to tradition. You know, I, I've always loved when we come out with kind of the traditional old football jerseys, you know, the blue ones with just jacks across the chest. I think that's great. Um, you know, anytime we can kind of pay homage to our, our uh, history and, um, you know, pull some of those things out, I, I think it's great. I, I think using it um, sparingly uh, is important because it makes it special. Um, you know, I think uh, you got to be careful incorporating it in where you now all of a sudden you're using it every third game. Uh, you know, probably not leaning towards doing anything like that. But um, I, I think it's fun to try some of those things. Obviously, football, you get a chance to do some things with helmets and, and pants and jerseys and do some different uh, pieces there. Uh, we'll continue. I think we'll have a couple of pretty cool things this fall for football. So, uh, you know, I think uh, we'll continue to do some of that. And and then it's really fun to have some of the student athletes involved in some of those decisions because they, they get a kick out of it. You know, they uh, love to have some input and then, uh, Hey, listen, if it makes them play better, uh, I'm all for it. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. if, if, uh, your mindset changes or maybe we, uh, uh, score a few extra points or uh, a few extra touchdowns or hit a couple extra home runs then then so be it. But, um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's part of that creative process. And, uh, we do have a ton of fans that are very traditional and want us to stick with the things that are us, you know, and what our school colors are. And I, I really appreciate that. I respect our history and tradition. At the same time, we got to blend that with being new a little bit, too. And uh, that's been nothing new for me uh, in 13 years here. You know, I, I worked really hard when I came in to make sure people understood this is one program. Uh, this isn't uh 
two different programs or two different divisions or anything else. Uh, if we didn't have those former student athletes and coaches do what they did, we'd have no chance to do what we do today. And I respect that a ton. I, I want them to be proud that the program looks like what they played in as well. And I, I think that's critically important. The uniform reflects some of that, um, how we paint our floors, how, how we use our colors, what we put in the bookstore, all that matters. But, uh, but it's been really fun to see, uh, the public out there uh, uh, sharing their own opinions on it too. And uh, you know, those things are just fun. It's fun to banter that around, especially in a time of year where it's maybe a little slower. We're in between getting to spring championships. So anything that can uh, create some interest in the Jackrabbits, I'm, I'm for that as well. Uh, the wrestling one, I got to work on that one a little bit. I, I still got to get there, but uh, nah, I, I say that in jest. But. Did, did you see Tanner Cook uh, posted uh, to Cody saying, uh, the NCAA says we have to get baby blue singlets now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and Cody said, posted a picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. I'll be talking to Cody tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I just think that's the coolest thing. That you're right. We are kind of in the dead period of you know waiting for the spring championships and stuff. There's not a lot going on. March Madness is wrapped up, and and we have that much interest and engagement around something that maybe isn't even going to happen. You know, the baseball jerseys happened, but uh, it's just pretty darn cool to have that level of interest and engagement right now in the programs. So, yeah. yeah and I, and I'll get sometimes, you know, I've had uh, several folks want to do, you know, when we play uh, USD in particular uh, that we're in all blue and they're in all red. And I, I think there's some cool things to think about, uh, you know, with that concept too. Um, uh, I, I love when we're in all blue for some of those rivalry games, uh, and mm -hmm. even NDSU as well. But I think, uh, uh, you know, maybe working with some of the other schools and how we kind of present uh, some of those games. Uh, we have a unique opportunity in having two rivals. Uh, most mm -hmm. schools uh, struggle to even have one, and uh, we're fortunate enough to have two. Yeah, good. Can you, can you speak quickly to how – I mean, I, I assume it's easier to pull this off for a, a baseball team compared to like a football team. Like it, as far as the financial part of it, is it, is it take, you know, a lot to get that done on like for a football Jersey change or helmet change? Yes, it's extremely expensive. Uh, you know, and that's one of the, the challenges of trying to uh, mix in uh, some new looks and, you know, look, 10 years ago, we were just trying to make sure we had good practice gear and decent <laughs> uniforms and that, <laughs> You know, as you continue to grow and, and uh, are able to drive a little bit more. And then Under Armour has been great to us. Uh, they work really well with us. They're, they're very creative and, and uh, uh, very supportive of helping us look at some different things. And then we've had some donors that have been willing to step up and, and do some of that work. And, uh, you know, football in particular, I mean, when you change out a helmet, I, they're 300, 350 bucks a piece. Uh, you know, so start adding up, uh, you know, 100 helmets or whatever, and it gets pretty, uh, pretty expensive to do some of those changes. And um, now we can do some with stickers uh, where we keep the same helmet. But, you know, if we if you win a totally different color scheme, it, it gets really expensive. So, um, you know, some of those things are certainly cost. But same time, we're also recycling uniforms out. We sell some at our auction. Uh, you know, there's other ways that we can drive some revenue. Obviously, all the, you know, military appreciation days or the dig pink games or uh, some of those things. We sell jerseys, uh, you know, to, to get some money back for some of those organizations. And so there's other good uh, kind of community uh, related reasons to do some of those jerseys as well. Well, I always need an excuse to add stuff to my main cave. So I'll I'll pledge <laughs> to buy any any alternate jersey or helmet you got i'll i'll buy one so you got that going for you <laughs> well i think if we if we put one of these babies on the auction this year that could get interesting i think exactly uh, exactly mm -hmm. i think there's an appetite for it yeah, yeah. Uh, pay attention you never know yeah justin um you know i listened back to the podcast from two years ago and it was right you know kyle kyle i believe asked about name image and likeness at that point um, and now it's actually happening. You know, it kicked off late last summer. Um, what have you seen? What's your perspective as an athletic director about name, image, and likeness and, and where we're at with that now today? Boy, uh, we could probably take an hour podcast on this one alone. <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, 
I think for a lot of us in the business, trying to figure out how you um, create more opportunities for students, especially when many of them are on partial or no scholarships. And so the opportunity to help pay for their education, the purity in that I think is is great. Um, you know, I think having the opportunity to, to do a summer camp uh, under your own name or to, to be able to work jobs or do other things, um, you know, so I'm a proponent for trying to help figure that out. At the same time, you know, it's really hard when really the two principles in NIL were you can't pay somebody for play. In other words, you know, you go score 20 points, I'll give you a thousand bucks. Uh, and you also can't use it in recruiting uh, to induce somebody to come to your place. And yet, uh, when you look across the board, I mean, people are giving NIL money because somebody averages 25 a game. So don't tell me it's not about how well you play. Uh, and secondly, the the whole recruiting piece with all these collectives and things that have been popping up, um, the Alston case and educational dollars, um, you know, we're, we're throwing um, all kinds of uh, money into this without a lot of guardrails, uh, you know, and to be frank, it's uh, because of uh, legal uh, um, threats that we've had or legal uh, issues we've had over time. So, uh, you know, I understand there's a balance there, but we, we can't forget we're still in the business of higher education. We're still in the business of getting students degrees. Um, you know, some schools have obviously stretched that and it's maybe more of a professional model in college athletics and that's fine. Uh, for a lot of us, it's not. And, uh, um, you know, I think uh, that's the one area that we got to be really careful on. How do we keep this kind of uh, somewhat together so we can provide those experiences across uh, the board to those students? And, you know, my only frustration over the last several years is, you know, people label the NCA as slow and lumbering. Uh, we don't do anything. Um, we're taking advantage of the student athletes. Uh, you know, we're using them or whatever the terms are. Uh, and, and in truth, um, if you look in the last five or six years, and I was on the Division One Council for six and a half years, uh, we did cost of attendance, we did time demands, we did early recruiting, uh, health and safety issues, concussion management, mental health. Uh, now we're in name, image, and likeness. We transformed the transfer rules. Um, mm -hmm. it, you can't tell me we didn't do a lot of things to benefit student athletes, let alone the fact that we try to hire great coaches. We've got the best trainers, the best strength and conditioning people. We're providing nutrition. We've got academic advisors. We have great facilities. You get to travel all over the country. You got a bunch of fans that want to come out and support you and watch you. And we act like that's zero and mm -hmm. that like we're down here and the rest of it needs to come up to here. Well, the truth is, look, we need to refine some things. No question. Uh, we need to look at gender equity. We need to look at um, how we help students uh, afford going to college. Um, but to get no credit for all the work that's put in and has been put in for 100 years, I would argue student athletes today are having by far the best experience that has ever been given. It's not even close in the last 120 years. And yet we act like it's a disaster and a terrible thing. And um, it's all defined by an Alabama football student athlete or a Duke basketball player, you know, like uh, that's. 2% of all the student athletes in the country that have a totally different experience. So I'm all for trying to figure those things out. It's worked well for us so far. We do have a few students that certainly have utilized it, but it's, you know, I look at it like a Maya and a Tori and, and the mm -hmm. things they're doing to get uh, money for uh, young girls to go to camps. I mean, what a cool idea. There's more students that are thoughtful about those things and opportunities than not. Uh, we're only going to read in the media about the ones that get a million dollars to go uh, be a quarterback at power five, whatever, um, you know, but the truth is a lot of these students are, um, you know, be able to get some uh, deals that just help uh, ease the edge off of the uh, cost of education. And I mean, there's a lot of gift certificates or, uh, you know, uh, cards to go eat at a restaurant or get a haircut or wash your car too. And uh, those are all great. It's, it's not all a hundred thousand dollar deals. Um, uh, you know, those are difference makers for those kids. Now, where does this evolve? You know, I'm not naive enough to know. We we have to be well aware of what collectives mean and what they are. We have to be well aware of how to utilize our cost of attendance or Alston uh, money uh, that can be tied to educational expenses. I'm not going to put my head in the sand and, and um, live in a world that doesn't allow us to be competitive. But we're going to be very thoughtful about how we do that um, and how we move forward. And I do not want to move to a professionalized model. Um, 
I personally think with the transfer issues and the NIL stuff, the more chaos that's out there, better for the Jackrabbits because um, we've got it together. Our students uh, are really good and thoughtful. They understand what we have to do to provide their experience, uh, which is how do we keep our corporate sponsorships because that helps pay for their experience at the same time working with us to help them navigate some of those opportunities to build a brand or to learn how to start a business or Mm -hmm. uh, learn financial literacy. So there's a combination approach. Too often, though, it's administrators versus student athletes. And that's not how it is here. Uh, We've got great relationships with our student athletes. Uh, We care about them. And in return, they care about us and understanding that. So you can make it work. I just think uh, like our society chases uh, all kinds of stuff and it's all about the individual and how much can I get? And um, we're winning games and and growing as a program because we've resisted that and we're, we're, we're tighter together than we've ever been. So you mentioned the transfer portal a couple of times and that's, this is probably something you could do another hour podcast on, but what are, uh, what are your quick thoughts on just the state of the transfer portal? Like how, how it's going and what, where do you think it needs to be, be and go? Yeah. Uh, first, uh, I always have this disclaimer because I'm trying to get the world right. And especially for all you folks that do media things. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I sat on a uh, the transfer working group as we looked at these issues uh, uh, two iterations ago. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, everyone wants to slam this portal. Um, look, the portal is a mechanic. It's where somebody puts their name so they can be uh, recruited in theory above board. If you don't have that, then everything's done third party through club coaches or whoever, and it gets to be total chaos, not that it isn't already. Um, So in theory, and and if you look at some sports, uh, volleyball, soccer, softball, uh, baseball, some of those, like the portal, when you put your name in, if you're really looking at transferring, you might have four or five additional schools you never even knew about that might be interested Mm -hmm. in you. And so I think there's a good thing, uh, frankly, related to the portal, but all we want to do is bash the portal. Well, it's actually the behavior. The transfer rule is the issue, and it's five sports. All the other sports have been able to do this forever. And so it's five sports. I would say 80% plus, it was probably 90% when we were going through this, are good transfers. There's students that want to still get a degree, but they may want to play. They may be buried on the bench. They may be have a family situation has changed. They want to get closer to home. Most of them, our coaches and student athletes are actually working together to get them to the place they want to go. Um, and so the numbers, especially in football, men's and women's basketball, are, are a little alarming, especially the numbers of students that aren't finding a home. Uh, that's of concern. Um the fact it was never really tied to anything academics, you know, we really wanted to see something. It's hard to transfer. It's hard to transfer and get a degree. And uh, and we're finding here, you know, it's it's hard for students to leave a place they love when you're taken care of. You aren't lied to. Um, you know, you got a chance to get a good degree and win some championships. Uh, you know, I think it's harder than people imagine on the outside to actually leave a place. And so, you know, are there going to be those uh, things that happen? Absolutely. Um, but I do think the market will correct a little bit over time. I think students not finding homes will maybe be a little more thoughtful before they uh, decide to run off and test the waters, um, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, I think it, there, there's some checks and balances there. But, you know, it's it's certainly a, a little bit concerning, but it's also reflective. Again, I say in our society, it's the quick fix. It's the you know, it's hard to uh, stick something out. It's hard to sit on the bench and not work your way up. Like we, we don't teach that as much anymore. And so, um, yeah, but again, it plays into our advantage because our co- coaches do a great job of treating their students with respect and taking care of them. And if they need to leave, we'll help them. Mm-hmm. That's my feeling on it. And, and in the last uh, 10 days, the portals treated the Jacks pretty nicely. Uh, with Matthew Morris coming on board. And I know she was a grant, grad transfer, but Drew uh, Gilton, is that how you say your last name? Gilton, uh, you know, from Utah, uh, former St. Thomas More uh, High School graduate. So uh, two high quality ads there uh, for the Jackrabbits in both men's and women's basketball. So 
Yeah, and, and I think a good point to that is, um, you know, we work really hard to recruit inside out. We want all the talent that we have around us, uh, certainly in the state of South Dakota. We'll work Minnesota, Nebraska, Iowa, uh, and then you grow from there. Um, you build off of uh, four-year uh, or five-year student athletes, and then, there, you know, there are uh, students that come in and uh, certainly can plug some holes or gaps or when you have graduation or you're trying to balance a class. Um, you know, there, there's some really good uh, transfer ads. Uh, and then if you're trying to build a program, though, on transfers at some point, um, I, I think it's really difficult. It's hard to get that buy in. We've won games because both those teams, I mean, their hallmark is no one cares who scores. No one cares who has how many rebounds or assists or they take a ton of joy in uh, the process of winning and, uh, and sharing uh, the joy of their teammates doing well. Um, and that's hard to do when you're constantly turning it out. Or frankly, if you have one person that has a hundred thousand dollar NIL deal and no one else does, I mean, there are things in the locker room that are part of sports that, um, you know, some of these things could have negative consequences trying to hold all that together. So, but, uh, yeah, really excited to have, uh, both of them as South Dakota uh, natives to be able to kind of come home and, uh, play at a high level and play in a great program. And they're going to be tremendous, uh, um, representatives of South Dakota State for us too. Mm -hmm. Justin, this is something that we've talked about before, and I know we're getting short on time here. Um, what what needs to happen to really get Sioux Falls to buy into Jackrabbit Athletics other than the Summit League Tournament? How do we fill Dana J. Dyko Stadium uh, with, with busloads of people from Sioux Falls? Yeah, well, I think, you know, we touched on a little bit environment, uh, you know, our ability to create a little different experience uh, in venue and then certainly tailgating uh, opportunity. You know, if we were able to get alcohol sales, I think that that turns it um, certainly trying to get, um, you know, uh, uh, transportation and do some creative things. We've tried to do that here in the past couple of years. Uh, you know, a few of our tailgating policies, frankly, have made it a, a tough. And uh, so if we could get that opened up a little bit, I think we've got a chance to really uh, help bring uh, other folks in. Certainly continuing to get students to show up as well is, is a big deal for total attendance. But Sioux Falls specifically, look, we've got, uh, I don't know, 11 or 12,000 graduates in, in Lincoln and Minnehaha counties. Um, you, go, you go down there, they're all wearing their Jacks gear. Um, I mean, they're proud as anything. Most of them will show up to the Summit League tournament. Um, we have to figure out how to activate them and get them to come up to Brookings as well. And, uh, you know, our plan is to kind of chip away. And just like we saw with the WNIT, I think there were a lot of people that probably came to their first or second game in the building in the month of March, um, you know. And, and so when they know it's going to be fun, if we can get them to come to, to that, then next year maybe they come to three or four games. Uh, a lot of people are going to buy season tickets because they got squeezed out and had to buy GA tickets and, and didn't want to do that anymore. And so, you know, you got to continue to build. It's not any one thing. Uh, but I, I do think uh, if we could activate that group that shows up to, to the Summit League tournament, and even if we could get, um, you know, 500 of them to show up to, to um, five or six games and another 500 to show up to three games, uh, maybe another 500 to show up to one, um, you know, you're starting to add to that. It doesn't take a lot of numbers, especially in frost. Football is a little different just because it's all day deal. It's a you get six of them usually in the fall as far as our home schedule. And so uh, we've got to target uh, our marketing efforts a little bit differently, uh, do some ticket promotions a little differently, certainly work with some businesses a little differently. And I'm really excited. Uh, I can't overstate Jordan Bow and Zach Hagan are awesome in our ticket office. And um, I mean, they're going to turn some things. You're going to see some things coming out of uh, our uh, ticket office that maybe we hadn't been able to do in years past. I mean, it's hard. They're managing all this stuff coming in at the same time. You got to go out and sell. And that balance is difficult. And so we've tied in with Brian Roms's sport management program and uh, students in that class that are getting on the phone and making calls for us. So they're gaining experience, but they're also helping us make sales and get people here. So we've got it's a sales academy is kind of how it's labeled. And we're going to expand that effort again this fall. We started it kind of late uh, into the middle of the fall last year. And so we're going to have a whole year under our belt. Um, they're very successful. So we've got some good things coming. Uh, people need to stick with us and uh, 
uh, we're going to get out there and uh, get people coming up to more and more games. And uh, I mean, we got a great uh, uh, product on the field or the court or our student athletes are fun to cheer for and they play fun styles of, uh, of each of their sports. They're fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Justin, we could talk to you all day. I know hmm. we could, um, but I, but thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Um, I don't know any athletic director, any other athletic directors in the country that would give a, a silly little podcast like ours an hour of time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Man, I don't know how many podcasts would take on a silly little athletic director either. So uh, <laughs> right, right back at you, but no, my, my pleasure. Always glad to connect. And it's fun to get uh, some of the information behind the scenes. It's so our world is complex right now. You know, college athletics is changing. Uh, we're trying to figure out what is even the definition of Division One. What's it look like as we move forward? Realignment, uh, you know, obviously, where does NIL go and all those things. But um, we, we've got some challenges tied in with enrollment challenges on campuses. Uh, we have to be really good for this university, uh, you know, and so there's some other pieces to it. And anytime we can help educate some folks on, on what's happening, I, I think uh, – you know, people want to support us even more, want to help us make these things happen, uh, get a better idea of all the things uh, that we're uh, trying to deal with to do something uh, really great. So um, our best five years, I think, are sitting right in front of us if we do this right. We got a chance to we've done crazy things. Uh, we're not done. Well, we're going to keep this thing going. Hey, let's go. All right. Um, thank you again, Justin. Appreciate that. Um, Monday night, we have... Uh, Steve Erpenbach is coming on, the, the president and CEO of the SDSU Foundation, just to give kind of a general overview of what's happening on campus. So excited to have Erp on with us. Uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, Wednesday, Brendan, Chad, maybe Dallas. Ben, are you hopping on with that? Yep. Uh, Ben's hopping on. Uh, a general conversation about just uh, uh, SDSU potpourri, I guess is what we'll call it. Um, and so it should be kind of a fun conversation there. Yeah. So, if, you're, if you're looking for suggestions, Justin, we'll, we'll have, <laughs> we'll have plenty of them for you on Wednesday night. So, <laughs> <laughs> but all right. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Justin. Uh, with that go big, go blue, go, Jax. go Jacks. Jax.